All right, guys, anybody out there yet? It's Mr. Pritchett. If you are there, um, just shoot me a letter with your name and say here. Nobody on there yet? Anybody out there? Hello, Stephen. Good to see you there. Anybody else? out there besides Stephen. Great, we got a few more. Hey, Ashley, good to see you. You too, Jessica, Brooke. Okay, Brooke is here. Lace, hello, Lace. And Brianna, you're here. And Nathan, okay, good. Hi, Dominique. Okay, Kira, you're there. Okay, I didn't recognize your name by, by Kira. I know Shakira. That's good. You're there. Good. And Kenya, you're here. Jordan, okay, glad you're here, Jordan.
Okay, can wait just another minute. See if Paul and Victoria and see. we'll have Jessica Shelley here. Jasmine's not here. Leslie's not here. And Shay's not here. Okay. Hope you guys had a nice break. I sure did. Bit of a challenge to come back to this, though. Okay, well, let's just go ahead and get started. Um, I assume you have your textbooks. So uh, that's where I am. I'm on page 340. Um, I don't know if you have, can do a split screen where you can see me and also draw up your uh, Pearson uh, program. But I'm on page 340. Just want you to, to get thinking a little bit in terms of what you might see on a test whenever we get around to figuring out uh, how a test is. Hi, Anisha. Good to see you here. We're on page 340 in the textbook, Anisha. So as you look down at the bottom of page 340, they got three illustrations there. Think for just a minute about a question that, that could show up. And uh, one of those questions might be something like, uh, name four um, physical differences between skeletal and cardiac muscles. As you look at those two illustrations down there, name four physical differences between skeletal and cardiac muscles. I mean, write something like that down on a scratch piece of paper. And then, um, then shoot, a, shoot an answer back to me. Good, Ashley. Voluntary and involuntary. Good. Cardiac has branches. Good. There's one. It's, so there's two. Uh, we wouldn't call voluntary and involuntary uh, physical differences. That's a functional difference. So keep that in mind. That wouldn't really be acceptable. But you're right in what you're saying. If I said functionally, what's different between them, Ashley, then you'd be saying uh Voluntary and involuntary. Okay, Brianna, good intercalated disc. That's a physical structure. So there's two of them now. We've got branches for the cardiac and intercalated discs for the, um, well, the cardiac branches. You've got intercalated discs for the cardiac cells. So um, anything else? Okay, multiple nuclei. Now, when you answer a question like that, uh, you want to make sure that, you know, on the test that you want to say multiple nuclei exist in a skeletal muscle 
whereas you have a single nucleus per cell in cardiac cells. So make sure you're, you're real clear on that. Anything else? Okay, I'll let you think about the other ones. Let's uh, let's do this. Let's go over to um, page 345. On page 345, you look down at the bottom right-hand corner, and that's where you'll find that number, 345. Just trying to get you thinking on the other stuff because that's the kind of things that will be uh, presented on uh, a test. So as you look on page 345, anybody having a hard time with that? It's a big picture. As a matter of fact, the title of it is the big picture. And you look up at the top left-hand corner and you see figure 10-6. I can't remember if we walked through that or not, but we want to go a little deeper if we didn't, if we did cover just a little bit. So as you look at that picture on page 345, figure 10-6, you see it, you see the, up at the top it says muscle. And then you come down across that muscle down, and you see the word epimysium. And then as you look at uh, this muscle and you see the outer covering, the epimysium, you move into the muscle and you see between these red uh, structures that are called fascicles. Can you look a little bit to the left at the top of the diagram, a little bit to the right rather, excuse me, at the diagram and you see the word fascicle and you see between fascicles, you have this little gray matter, and that little gray matter, as you, if you come down a little bit under the fascicle where it's extended, you see the word perimysium. Hi, Paul. Glad you're here. Now, those are pieces of connective tissue. And you see, uh, when you look at perimysium, you see there's a line that's going from the word perimysium up to the fascicle. Now, if you had to define, explain what a fascicle is, what would you say as you look at that diagram? How would you define it? Anybody come up with an answer yet? You can type in. Okay, let's look at uh, look at the fascicle. And, of course, it's surrounded by perimysium. And as you um, look at the cutaway view of the fascicle, you see little pink structures in there, and then you see little gray matter going around those pink structures. So what you see a fascicle is cons uh, is made of, consists of, is a muscle fiber, a number of muscle fibers 
put together. <clears throat> if you look at the extended muscle fiber, and, and then you come back toward the cutaway view of the fascicle, you see the gray that surrounds things. Uh, follow, follow to the left of that uh, muscle fiber. Come down where you see um, paramysium, and then go to your left and come down again. You see the term endomysium. Anybody not see that? This is where I wish we had that face to face and had the uh, program to point that out, make it a little more easily understood. That's right, Stephen. It is a band of connective tissue. So when you look at the endomysium, which surrounds a muscle fiber, and you look at the perimysium, which surrounds a group of muscle fibers, and then you look at the epimysium, which surrounds the whole muscle, all of that is connective tissue. So it weaves all the way through. Hi, Heather. Good to have you with us. That's great. Let me mark you present. Let's see. Where are you, Heather? There you are. Okay. Okay. Does everybody see the endomysium in that middle view, in that middle uh, illustration? And as uh, Stephen has already said, it's a band of connective tissue. What kind of connective tissue is it? What do you think, Paul? What kind of connective tissue is the endomysium? Which is the same structure of paramysium, which is the same structure of epimysium. What kind of connective tissue is that? You already know that connective tissue. Anybody come up with an answer yet? Well, I'm going to get you to look it up. You just might have a question on that. Anyway, <clears throat> go back to the Okay, I'll try to repeat that question, uh, Stephen. Uh, as you look at the, the top third, let's say, of that page, and you see where it says muscle and fascicle, and then you see the, the, the fascicle consists of a number of other structures, and that here comes one of those structures out. Look at the little brown arrow right below it. It points down to a muscle fiber. And so there is a connective tissue. If you look at the muscle fiber, come over to the left of that middle illustration of a muscle fiber, and you see endomysium. The endomysium is the same kind of connective tissue as the perimysium, and the perimysium is the same kind of connective tissue as of the epimysium. Thank you, Akenya. That's it. Dense, regular connective tissue. What do you know about dense, regular connective tissue? What are some of its characteristics? That's right, Lace. 
All the fibers go in one direction. That's true. That's, that's structural. So all the fibers going in one direction um, give it a certain characteristic. What do you know about dense regular connective tissue in terms of a characteristic? Not a physical, but a, a, um, a structural characteristic, but it's functional characteristic. That's right, Heather. It goes in one direction. Uh-huh. That's correct. What about its function? What's one of the characteristics of its function? Strength. That's right, Akenya. Strength. If you follow that into to the top of the top third of that picture, and you've got the endomysium around that. Uh, muscle fiber, you've got the perimysium around the fascicle, and you've got the epimysium around the muscle, and they all go together to the left, and you see it forms a, what does it form? What is the structure that it's formed to the left of the muscle? Up at the top. I got two cameras on me here. One over here, big camera over here down to the left, a small camera. So my face is always going this way and that way. That's right, Stephen, Heather. It's a tendon. And tendons do what? What's the whole purpose of a tendon? That's right, Heather. Connect bone to bone, bone to muscle. Yeah, we want to say, actually, you want to say muscle to bone. <laughs> you got the right idea, but you want to, uh, it's, it's a good way to put it, vice versa. So you want to hold muscle to the bone. That's right, uh, Brooke. And Stephen, that's correct. Sometimes those tendons are so strong that when a muscle really contracts hard, Sometimes you can literally break a bone. Uh, there are people who have coughed so hard that they have cracked a rib. So it's not impossible to do. Usually our bones are pretty strong, as we know. But anyway, just trying to get you squared away now with that connective tissue. Now, any questions about that connective tissue? We've only gotten about, what, a dozen questions out of there. Anybody have a question? Okay, so let's go back up to the top third of that page. You see the fascicle. You see it's coated with uh, perimysium. And then you look at the cross section of the, fa of the fascicle and you see it's composed of muscle fibers. Now, you see one of the muscle fibers extends to the right. And right above that, I want you to write muscle fiber. This is on that diagram. Right above muscle fiber, I want you to write, W-R-I-T-E, muscle cell. Same thing. It's just another way of calling uh, what it is, naming it. And then go right above the muscle cell and put the word myocyte. Myocyte. Site's a root word for cell. MYO is a root word for muscle. So you can all, you can use any of those three terms when you talk about a muscle cell, skeletal muscle cell. Okay, any questions about that? Give you a few seconds to type something in if you uh, have a concern. Now let's come down to the middle of that illustration and you see muscle fiber. So that's a muscle cell. 
can also call it a myocyte. You see the endomysium over to the left. Same kind of connective tissue that the paramysium is, that the epimysium is. So you've got a lot of strong tissue for those muscles. And then when you look down below in the mysium, you see the word sarcolemma. The sarcolemma is the cell membrane of the muscle cell. So the cell, the sarcolemma would be inside the endomysium. Endomysium surrounds that whole muscle cell, and the sarcolemma is the cell membrane. What is the cell membrane of a, of a muscle cell composed of? What are the substances that are put together to make that cell membrane? See how I'm getting you to go back all the way to, what, chapter 2, maybe? Mm -hmm. What is that sarcolemma made of? Phospholipid bilayer, that's correct. It's made of a phospholipid bilayer. So it's got phosphorus in it, and we know it's got lipid in it. So those would be the components that make it up. So as you move to the right now, where you see sarcolemma, you move to the right. Now you're inside the cell, and you see these little structures going, uh, look like little cylinders extending from the cell over to the right, and where you see the one that's extended the farthest, I want you to write right above it, myofibril, myofibril. And then right below it, I want you to write an organelle. So you know inside a cell are a number of structures that we call organelles. Name a structure that is an organelle in a cell other than a muscle cell. Or just name an organ inside any cell. Good. Stephen, there's one nucleus. Ashley, give me one. Give me an organelle inside a, a cell. Mitochondria, good. Brooke, is this a per, you mean permanent thing like for the rest of the semester? <laughs> well, they're kind of leaning this way, Brooke, so um, we'll let you know probably for sure, let's see, the 23rd is next Monday, so 24, 25, 26, 26, by the 27th, you'll know if we're going to be able to come back to school. But it sounds like they're just going to keep it up until we hit the end of April. Okay, Paul, smooth and rough ER. Stephen, you heard that what I just said, didn't you? So maybe by next Friday we'll know, but I, it sounds like they're really going to push this. Okay, ribosomes, Heather, good. Okay, so in the muscle cell, you've got myofibrils, and that is considered to be an organelle. Now, what I want you to do is go back to page 343. Go back to page 343. If I look at you this way, it looks more like I'm looking at you instead of off into the blue yonder.
Okay, on page 343, you see a, a very similar picture. And you see over there to the right, sticking way out to the right, you see a myofibril. And, and there you can write, those are organelles. And then you see cytosol. That's the sort of semi-fluid um, that we could call it intracellular fluid. It's got proteins in it and so forth, so it's not just pure water, but it's about 80% water. Now, look up at the top of that diagram. That's uh, figure 10-4, and you see something similar to what we just went over. When you get to the central portion of that page, you're looking at a muscle cell, and you see endomysium. Now we're working our way in. We're looking inside the cell around the myofibrils. So you want to circle and note sarcoplasmic reticulum. That's the blue material there. So that's kind of like the ER. Now, one of the things that the sarcolemma does is if you'll look to the right, you will see the term transverse tubule. That is an invagination of the sarcolemma that traverses the muscle cell. That's an invagination of the sarcolemma which passes through the muscle cell. And you see that it lies on top of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now look below and right, and you see a little box that shows a magnified view of the transverse tubule of the sarcolemma. They do not list the sarcoplasmic reticulum there, but that's the blue stuff that you see in there, the blue structure. And then on either side of the tubule, you see the term terminal cisterni. So you have a tubule, and on either side of that tubule, you have enlarged cavities that are called cisterni. Uh, one of the things that you probably haven't seen um, or used a word like that, people used to catch rainwater and they would let it come off the roof and it would run into some sort of a structure, a hollow structure in the ground. That was the way they got their drinking water. And they called that a cistern, just like you see there, C-I-S-T-E-R-N. So it's an enlarged area. And we're going to talk about the function of it in just a few minutes. So you have a terminal cisterni on either side of the transverse tubule. Therefore, you have a triad, the tubule and two inflated, enlarged portions of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Invagination means an enfolding. It's an enfolding. Here, here's a tube, or let's say my fingers are a tube, and then if it folds in and is hollow in the center, that's an invagination. It's like a, a pocket here. And in our case, it's a tube goes all the way 
through the muscle cell, but it's a it's a hollow uh, structure that is formed on the outside by tissue. In our case, it's a sarcolemma, the cell membrane. When, uh, just to um, maybe help clear it up, when um, a fetus, you know, starts out as a one cell structure and it begins to multiply and eventually forms into an embryo, there are places on the body where tissue folds inwardly to form a structure. Uh, you can see the word vagina in that term invagination. That's a folding in of tissue to form a pocket, form a pouch. We see that in the GI tract of the starfish. The GI system is uh, the cells down here at the uh, bottom know that uh, it's going to be GI tract, and they fold in like this to make the GI tract. That's an invagination. Hopefully that kind of makes it a little clearer for you. Now, while we're still on this, excuse me, this page, as you look at the top again, and you see the word cytosol, I want you to write beside the word cytosol, the word glycogen. And you probably know glycogen. Uh, what category would glycogen fit in, those four biological categories? Which category would glycogen fit into? Anybody got, anybody got an idea of what category it's in? How about you, Anisha? You've been quiet. What kind of a substance is glycogen? You only got four choices. Paul, oh, that's correct, Stephen. That's right. That's good. Well, he beat you to it, Anisha, but anyway. Carbohydrates, polysaccharides, that's good. And, of course, we use those for energy, don't we? Now, I want you to write another term beside the cytosol. And that term is myoglobin. Myoglobin. That's M-Y-O. Obviously, that's a root word for muscle. And then globin is G-L-O-B-I-N. It certainly makes you think of glob, but uh, it's uh, probably a protein that stores oxygen in our muscles. I did a little reading the other night just for the fun of it. And I found out that animals like seals and uh, whales, and there are probably others too, but I just didn't get that far. Uh, but uh, myoglobin um, holds oxygen, and those organisms like the whales and the seals and uh, others that are actually mammals, they can dive quite deeply in the ocean for long periods of time because they have a lot more of this substance, myoglobin, that carries oxygen so that they can draw on it when they're down 2,000 feet swimming around doing whatever whales and seals do at that depth, 1,500 feet or so, and then they come back up. 
to refresh that. Now, one other thing, as you um, as you look at this diagram on page 343, you see at the bottom of, not the bottom of the page, but the bottom of the middle illustration of the muscle cell, you see nucleus and you see mitochondria. And, of course, mitochondria produces what? That's right, Akinya. Energy. These muscles move. They need oxygen. They need ATP. And the mitochondria produce that energy so that we might be able to keep those muscles going. Now, this figure could show up on one of your tests. And we would ask you to uh, label it. And see, so you've got a lot of things here that you can add, that uh, you could put on there. And the same thing is true over to um, page 345. A little bit redundant there, but got some pretty good uh, artistry there in terms of drawing the muscle, muscle cell. So let's go back to page 345. And we're going to be on this page and the previous page for a little bit. So let's come down to the third structure on page 345. And you see at the top of that little structure, that's the third structure down. You got the muscle, then you got the muscle cell, and then you got this uh, myofibril. And it's not labeled, but I want you to look, let's see, look over on page 346. You probably remember this a bit from uh, 110. But that's basically the same drawing that's on page 345. That's a myofibril, a section of it. And you see the boundaries of a uh, structure called a sarcomere. Now, if somebody asks you what a sarcomere was, maybe some of you have read ahead, how would you define a sarcomere? That's right, Dominique. Mitochondria do produce ATP. <laughs> I understand, Stephen. It's a little bit different, a little more cumbersome, isn't it? I agree with you. Well, keep in mind, um, Brooke and Stephen, you're looking at a, an illustration of a structure that you're responsible for. So you got to know the structure before we can actually get into the physiology of it. So I think if you take the time to read it over several times, you'll become familiar with it and comfortable with it. 343, 345, and uh, 346. That's all we've got at this point. You don't want us to, hmm, what would you say, break our social distance? That is the contractal unit. That's right, Akinya. Uh, the sarcomere is the contractile unit of a muscle. We got a lot of sarcomeres in our muscles. Thousands of them. So, as you look at a sarcomere on page 346, this one's labeled. 
Do you see the little lines going out to the right and to the left? And you have that line that just zigzags back and forth, which they call the Z disk. So that's the limit of one sarcomere. Now we need to learn of what a sarcomere is composed. So as you look at it, you see over to the left where the first little bend is, you see that little purple, um, it's actually a protein, it's twisted. It's kind of interesting, it's not just flat, interesting is it, it's not, not uh, flat, it's just, it's twisted. You see that's called a thin filament and that thin filament is actin. A particular kind of protein. And you go to the right, you see the next zigzagging line. That's probably why they call it a Z-disc, because it zigzags. And you see another thin filament moving toward the other thin filament. And between them, in the middle, is a thick filament called myosin. Now look at the very bottom of the picture. We're on page 346. And you see the term I-band, A-band, and I-band. They have words for those. Uh, they're called the isotropic band, isotropic. ISO, T-R-O-P-I-C. So if someone asks you of what does the I-band consist, of what is the I-band composed of, you would say actin filaments. We're going to add something to that in just a few minutes, though. Those are the thin filaments. And then you come down to the bottom again, and you see in the middle a band, which means an isotropic. If you see an, a n in front of a word, it usually means without. And in this case, it means without light. So your myosin and part of the actin filaments overlap. You can see the word zone of overlap. And because you got a thick piece of, middle of myosin in the middle, it tends to not let light come through easily. So they call that the I of the A band. Now, as you look in the middle, in the middle of the picture, you see M line. Now, that's another kind of protein. You can see why we need to eat plenty of chicken or fish or whatever because uh, we've got to turn their protein into our protein. So that M line is a protein that helps anchor the myosin filaments. Maybe tonight when you're with your family or whoever, you can discuss over uh, 
a steak or some salmon or some chicken or something like that about the actin filaments and the myosin filaments and the M line that anchors, as does the zigzagging line. That's another protein. So they're just not flopping around in our arms or our hands or legs or whatever. They're actually in position. And I want you to know this other one, this other protein, still on this same diagram. Look to the left of the block and look up at the top of the block. And you see it says elastic filament. Now, as you look at that, it looks like a coil, doesn't it? Now, some of you uh, maybe have uh, understood that your car uh, rides on springs or coiled springs. And so your tires can give when you hit a bump and it won't jar the whole car. That, that uh, coil compresses and then pushes back down. It can be stretched and it'll come back to its normal um, position. But you see what it does. That little coiled um, protein has a word, has, is, is a protein, and it's called titan, T-I-T-I-N. If you look on page 344, They give you a close-up view of the Titan, and you can see how it looks like a spring. And you know, springs like that, you can compress them, and then they will come back to normal. You can stretch them a little bit, and they will come back to normal when that pressure is released. So it's very elastic, but it plays a very important role in keeping order in the sarcomere. Now, if you're if you're on three forty four, look to the right, and you see a myosin uh, molecule, and you see an actin molecule. Those are proteins. And you see that the myosin has tails and it has heads, little rounded heads. They pull out one for you where you see a thick filament. There it says A, thick filament. There's your tail, there's the hinge, and there's the head. Now, you've got a group of those proteins together. It's not just one protein. It's a group of them together. You see how they pulled that one out, and you see that uh, you've got a tail, a hinge, and a head, and even a neck. Now look below myosin. Yes, Heather, that's correct. That's correct. Figure 10-5. Is everybody seeing that? No, is anybody having a problem with it? Visualizing what I'm saying? So you got the myosin. There's the big molecule there. To the right, myosin tails, myosin heads. That's the whole molecule, a number of the myosin proteins, then you come down and you see these little purple balls, and that's the actin. That's the thin filament. Different protein. What makes one protein different from another protein? Give me an answer, guys. What makes one protein like myosin different from the protein actin? 
several things. What would you like to put down for it? Well, Heather, I'm glad you got you're glad you found it on 342. You got a, a different edition probably. But you found it, and that's good. So how is one protein different from another? Okay, Kenya says sequences of amino acids. That's right. Just like our letters, our words has different letters in them. The, the sequence is important. Anything else? Paul says the same thing, different sequences of amino acids. That's good. That's right, the number of amino acids, the types of amino acids, the sequence that those amino acids are arranged in, that's what makes different proteins. It, just like our, how many words can we have in our dictionary? And they're all made out of 26 letters. But how they're arranged, well, we get a lot of words. As a matter of fact, we invent words, don't we? So the same thing is true here with these proteins. The amino acids, the sequence, the type of amino acids, the number and so forth, that all determines the, uh, you know, ultimately the function of the protein. So you see there's a, a actin. It's like a little ball. And you see it says it has an active site in it. That's where the head of the myosin filaments attaches to actin. We're going to see how that works in just a few minutes. We got well, it's three o'clock. We got a few more minutes here. Hang in there. I know you're suffering, but uh, don't give up. And I want you to know, as you look at actin, now actin's the purple. You see the blue line? It's another protein, tropomyosin. And you look over to uh, the left, actually, of tropomyosin. That's the blue filament. You see the little yellow balls there? Got another one over in another section. That's the protein troponin. Pretty complicated, isn't it, guys? I understand. I have been through it. But you can do it. Now, I want you to look over on page 347. I'm not sure what uh, you have, Heather. It's um, look for figure 10.8. It would probably be close to that if they've got the same picture. See where you got your hands like this? Okay. So we know that when contraction takes place, the filaments slide over each other. The sarcomere shortens. And you've got hundreds of sarcomeres in a line in that one mile fill, uh, in that one mile fibrio. So when we contract, they slide over each other because the myosin heads attached to the actin, back on page 344, myosin heads attached to the actin, and they pull the actin into the center of the M line. Don't faint on me now. I know this is a lot to take, take in in one lecture, but you got all weekend to look it over. Let that sequence 
sink into your head. That's what's going on while you're writing and your fingers are moving or you're putting your hand on your head going, good grief, I'll never learn this stuff. It all takes muscle movement and that's where these filaments are pushed or pulled together. They call it a sliding filament theory. Look over on page 348, if you would, please. This is figure 10-9. Now you can look up at the top. Looking at uh, the figure A. You look at the top of figure A and you see it says relaxed sarcomere. So as you move, what happens is... Below there, where you see the actin filaments are pulled into the middle where the M line is. Remember the myosin head attaches to actin and then it contracts. It pulls in those filaments. What are you promising, Steve? <laughs> Not the easiest course you've ever taken in your life for me either. I had to study hard too. But you can see how the Z lines come closer to each other. The, the sarcomere. contracts. It is shortened. Now I want you to go back to page 346. <laughs> That's good, Stephen. That's good. Now, as you look at this, this figure 10-7 again, think about when those filaments, actin, without actin filaments, are pulled in toward the M line, what happens to the coil? What happens to that coil protein called Titan? They shoot me an answer. What happens to that coil when those actin filaments are pulled into the M line and the Z lines get closer to each other? What happens to those Titan proteins? It doesn't stretch at this point. It does the opposite. See, so you're bringing the Z lines closer to each other. Therefore, you're compressing that coil. I know that you you've been driving cars all ever since you hit 15 or 16, and you know the last thing on your mind was about the springs on which your car rides. But when you hit a run over something, what a some sort of an object, that tire comes up because it didn't just break through, but it comes up, and that spring gets compressed. 
but because the tire comes back down, it goes back to its original strength, original uh, position. But these coils here would push the Z lines back into their normal position in a relaxed state. Got to let that sink in a little bit, don't you? Now, that's a coil that can be stretched. So, you know, you can stretch your arm out and stretch the muscle. Some of you have done that sometimes. Uh, and, of course, it'll bring the Z lines back uh, to the proper position. Okay, it's 306. So we're going to knock off here, but when we come back on, let's see, today is Wednesday. When we come back on Monday, what we're going to do is go over into page pages 350, 352, 53, 55, and so forth. And don't drop dead when you see what we've got to cover. We're not going to get everything in there. But we're going to give you a little skeleton type of uh, sequence of events so that you know what's happening whenever you just walk from your computer to your bathroom or whatever. Or you get outside and stretch and need to walk for a mile and get a little exercise. So we'll, we'll pare it down a little bit and then you'll uh, understand how that impulse goes uh, through the muscle. Calcium is going to be involved with that. Don't have enough calcium, you got a problem. Big problem. You want to have the right kind. Does anyone have, let's see, Heather Strickland. Oh, like a spring in a pen. That's a great example, Heather. It's very good. So that would be when you press that little knob at the end, it's like contracting, and that spring is shortened. As soon as you let um, press it again and it uh, releases that, catch, the spring pushes it back to the normal position. That's good. Very good, Heather. Very practical example of that. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, don't give up yet. Just go over it. The more you go over it, the better you will understand it. It'll start to fall in place, but you got to do that. Some of you may have been athletes, or maybe you're musicians. Maybe you played in a high school band, and you had to go over and over that music and all the marching steps and things like that. Okay? When will our chapter, let's see, when will our chapter 5 and 6 test be? As soon as they figure out, Lace, how they're going to do that. I think that they're going to require that you have a camera on your laptop or uh, maybe on your computer. Like I've got a camera up here at the top of this monitor and one over here at this monitor. So as um, soon as they figure out how they're going to do it, uh, I'm going to let you know. And I'll probably have to download a test into D2L and then you'll be responsible to take it there. You won't be able to get up or anything like that. So you, you got to go to the bathroom, get it all done so that you're there for an hour, maybe an hour and 15 minutes. And there's going to be a camera that's going to be watching you. Unfortunately, some folks want to do the wrong thing. So that's why they're trying, that's why they're going to do that. So uh, we stop that. And if we don't have a camera, I hope they'll give me an answer, Steve. I'm not real sure. Um, I just don't have an answer for you yet. As soon as I get one, we'll work it out then. 
they even mentioned, uh, I know this is the case too, they mentioned that if somebody doesn't have a camera and can't get one or whatever, they don't have enough money for it. And I don't know how much they cost, but they mentioned that they might let people come into the testing center at certain hours so there would be this uh, social acceptable distance between people. So that that might be an, uh, an alternative for you if you don't have a, um, a camera. Okay, any other questions? Okay, avoid those crowds. You don't want to catch this stuff. Not that it's going to kill you, but uh, you don't want to give it to somebody else. Okay, I'm going to sign off here, all right? I think you can come back anytime today, tomorrow, whatever, and look at the, the uh, presentation again. Hopefully it sinks in a little better. Y'all have a good weekend, all right? Bye-bye.